Happy Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, September the 22nd, 2020, and back with daily Bible reading for today. And today's texts come to us uh, from Psalm 119, 97 through 104, Numbers 11, 1 through 9, Romans 16, 17 through 20. Uh, or you could have read Psalm 106, 1 through 12, and Genesis 28, 10 through 17, and then again end up with Romans uh, 16, 17 through 20. And once again, I'm going to say this because I haven't said it in a while, uh, but the daily Bible readings that we use come from the Revised Common Lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of readings in which if, um, if your church follows it and your pastor uses it, um, over the course of three years, if they pretty much stick to it, you kind of go all the way through the Bible. And so you have a year A, a year B, and a year C. A typically follows the Gospel of Matthew. Um, B typically follows Mark. C typically follows Luke, the three synoptic Gospels. And then John is interspersed throughout there. Um, and so it's a pretty good way of the church kind of going through the whole text of the Bible. And along with that, tied to it, are daily Bible readings that you can access um, if you Google Vanderbilt Lectionary. It'll, it'll come up. You'll see daily Bible readings, and um, you can you can follow through with that. And it's kind of it's set up nicely because, um, like Thursday and Friday and Saturday, the texts are selected and uh, in order to get you ready for the Sunday texts, the Sunday sermons, and then um, Monday through Wednesday are kind of to follow up on that to continue you thinking on on what the uh, what the sermon was for Sunday and what those texts talk about. So I just thought I'd remind everybody about what the daily Bible readings are based on, what the lectionary is. And, and like I've said before, it's interesting to me how timely it always is um, and can be. And it sometimes it just seems like, hey, it was picked just today for whatever the current affairs are. But it's not. It's just kind of how it works out because Scripture is always timely. So anyway, having said that, uh, I'm going to ask the question with uh, Jacob today in um, in Genesis 28. How awesome is this place? It's I just love the way uh, the New Revised Standard pers- uh, for that New Revised Standard version puts it out. Um, he asks this question: How awesome is this place? I just picture him like you know waking up after his experience here, this the Jacob's ladder passage, and just being amazed uh, at, at his experience there. Um, and being amazed with the place, which is kind of interesting because the place wasn't really anything special. It doesn't even tell us, like, you know, give us an exact location. It just says, you know, he came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because it was dark. Um, and this is important because he's this is after he's really irritated his brother, Esau, right, and is running in fear, really, because uh, he's afraid, um, and rightly so, that his brother is going to try to kill him. Um, and so he goes out and he's he stops for the night. He doesn't really pick a place. He just wherever he's tired enough and he drops and puts a rock under his head as a pillow. And that's where he has this experience with God. And it kind of begs the question, where do we meet God, meet God? the places that we meet God? Um, and I think for us, the places that we think or the only places that we think we can meet God these days Um, And I think it's something that we're kind of dealing with right now in the church. Um, But the places we meet God are often tied to uh, to a false sense of places. Um, In other words, it's as if God can only be in one place. Like we have developed that sense in our head that that God is limited to these specific places that we've set aside. And that's the only place where God can be, will be, and where we can meet him. Um, it's, it's It's as if he can only be found at church, right? Um, as if his powers can only be had in those um, kind of sacrosanct places that we put aside for him. Um, and that made me think of uh, an experience that John Wesley had. If you read his journals, he talks about when he begins field preaching. And what he literally means is going out in a field and preaching. Um, and if you go and you look in his journals for 1739, at, right at the end of March in 1739, he talks about this guy named Whitfield, George Whitfield, who was probably at his time um, one of the biggest, the most famous preachers uh, of his time. Matter of fact, Benjamin Franklin talks about him. He's 
probably the only creature that Benjamin Franklin has anything good to say about in his autobiography. Um, but he talks about his friend George Whitfield, and who had been doing this field preaching. And Wesley talks about how he was trying to get his head wrapped around this idea of not preaching in a church. And he says this, he says, I could scarce reconcile myself to the strange way of preaching in the fields of which he set me an example on Sunday. He says, having been all my life, till very lately, so tenacious of every point um, relating to decency and order that I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. In other words, he just, he thought that, you know, the biggest thing was like the order and um, the decency of the church. That was indecent and completely out of order for you to do anything uh, related to the work of saving souls outside of the church bu- the church building proper. And, and he doesn't just mean the church as in, you know, the, the gathering of people. No, he, he's really talking about the buildings, right? The actual sp- holy spaces of the church. That Like, there's no work of God that can go on outside of those. You can't save souls outside of church. He, that's, he admits, it's like, kind of where he was the, the really if not specifically assented to it in practice that's really what he was believing um and so but he follows wesley uh, he, wesley follows whitfield's example and starts to go out and starts to learn something um a couple of days later on the 2nd of april he says at four in the afternoon i submitted to be more vile which is an interesting phrase and he says, and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence. In other words, he found a little hilltop, a little high spot on the side of the road, speaking from a little eminence in a ground to about 3,000 people. And this is where it began, I think, to make sense to Wesley. Uh, Wesley discovered that God was working where the people were, not where they were not. Let me put that again. Wesley realized that God was where the people were. God wasn't going to bother with the places they were not. Um, maybe that sounds kind of harsh. But anyway, this is the lesson that uh, that Jacob, I think, is realizing in his experience as he's sleeping out in the field. Um, God speaks to Jacob in the midst of his fear and his loneliness because it had to have been a terribly lonely pl- place for him to be. And he says this to him. He says, know that I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to the land, to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Um, and that's that's the word that he gives to him in this moment, in this experience that, uh, that Jacob is having of God at his, as he's out in the wilderness on his own, uh, out alone, sleeping in the field. And Jacob's response, he wakes up and he says, how awesome is this place? Um, and what made it awesome, it wasn't that this, the place itself was that special or that anybody centuries before had built it and said, this is the only place you can meet God. No, Jacob realized that the thing that made that place awesome is because that's where God was. That's where God met him. Um, and for him, it became like, you know, he's like, this is like the gateway to heaven. This is like God's house right here. Um so the church finds itself out in the field, right? And we find ourselves out in the field mourning the loss of our place, um, you know, that and we're kind of bedding down on this pretty rocky reality. Uh, and we spend all our time, I think, dreaming of what we call home as if, you know, because we don't have these places and that the people aren't going to these places, um, that somehow God's work can't be done. Maybe we're kind of like Wesley, and we like think, well, without the church building, you can't really save souls. Um, you know, we've forgotten two things that I think Jacob and Wesley, John Wesley, learned. The first of all is that God is with with us uh, wherever we go, and that um, makes any place pretty awesome. That the same promises made to Jacob he's made to the believers in Christ that he will he goes with us he goes ahead of us um and that he will not depart from us until he's made that promise that he made to us come to its fullness um and that God's house is anywhere that God is that we don't (laughs) we don't you know have to have all these things and we don't have to tie ourselves down like we think we do Uh, I've seen congregations just evaporate uh 
you know, once they, you know, don't have the, the building. I know I've seen congregations where it seems like they're much uh, more faithful to a building than they are to their God. So, you know, it's like, it's like there's this lost art of field preaching that maybe the church is having to relearn in these times. Maybe we should submit to be more vile, uh, learn to proclaim the tidings of salvation where the people are um, instead of where they're not. Anyway, that's the DVR for today. I uh, hope you have a good afternoon, a good evening, and we'll be back tomorrow.